Next, I'd like to ask um, Sally, Sally Jones, to tell us a little bit about how she gardens and why she gardens. And Sally has a path that's a little bit similar to mine and uh, sort of a Midwestern start and uh, somehow ended up back here out, out east. And while she's moved a number of times, it sounds like your family's been in Chester County for a while and Longwood Garden has been an inspiration for you. And so uh, you're sort of coming at this from more of a horticultural focus, Sally, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, uh, Joan, and hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. I'm going to talk about um, what I did to my front lawn to change it from a monoculture to um, a pollinator garden and uh, one that attracts birds and bugs. And so that's what I thought I would talk about tonight. And I hope that fits in the scope of our program. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I was lucky, very fortunate to grow up on 50 acres of sort of abandoned farmland in Ohio and love to just roam and look at what grew, um, get my nose down in the bugs in the soil. And, um, but ever since then I've lived on an acre or half an acre where there's been very, a lot of maintenance with lawn and beds and plants. I never met a plant I didn't like. So I would get one from a friend or I would start one and plant it. And then there's all the mulch that goes around and the lawn. And um, several years ago when we retired, um, I said to my husband, let's go find a very small plot of land. And we found a house in Westchester. We have a 10th of an acre. And um, I said, no lawn. And uh, so this is a little bit of the story about what we've done in the front yard and I'm working on the side and backyard in a similar way. Um, let's see. So I've grown, I do grow vegetables. I have a plot at um, the West End Community Garden. My husband's family has two farms in Avondale and we grow asparagus, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, lime, Dr. Martin lima beans. We do a lot of our vegetable gardening there where there's a little more space and actually um, full sunshine, which works great. So I made a little sort of storyboard. Um, so I'd like to share my screen. I'm actually not in Westchester tonight. Um, I'm in Minneapolis <laughs> uh, visiting. My husband and I are visiting. So I'm using a computer I've never used before. And um, here we go. So please bear with me. I hope everybody can see the screen I've shared. Um, does that look right to everybody, what you're seeing? Okay. Yeah, let's look, it's good, thanks. Okay, great. So um, in the course of some of my classes and reading and noodling on the internet, I've been really interested uh, in learning about lawn alternatives. And um, so based on a recommendation from one of my instructors at Longwood Gardens, um, he steered me toward two books. And I'm one of those people who can, who likes to read books and then do experiments. And that's pretty much what I've done here. <laughs> so I'll take you through my um, slides and do a, just a brief uh, explanation. So um, this is the slide on the left, obviously, is the front yard. We live in a twin on Union, West Union Street. And um, there was a lawn um, and beds around the house with lots of mulch. The screen on the right um, is my front yard meadow, the same yard that you're seeing. If you were standing in the at the lower left-hand corner of the first slide and you were looking um, west down the street, this would be that end <laughs> of my front yard. <clears throat> so it's, there's a different combination, different combinations of grasses and um, some native plants, some not native plants, but the idea was to cover the ground and change maintenance into management um, to, because my husband uh, and I decided when we retired, we would visit our three children who live in Minnesota, Oregon, and Washington State, and we have four grandchildren, and we didn't want to have to have somebody come and maintain our property. 
So my goal was no weekly mowing, no watering, no mulching, no fertilizing, and no worrying about pets. Um, Nix the maintenance. Yes to all the perennial plants that I love and many new ones yet to be discovered that have colors and textures and layers and completely cover the ground. I wanted this to be a dynamic community of plants that would change through the season, evolve from year to year, and yes, be, um, you know, habitat for birds and butterflies and bees and lots of insects. So how to go about changing from this maintenance of mowing and blowing and raking and that sort of thing to just managing it, um, managing the yard. This is a person that I follow, Benjamin Vogt. He's in Nebraska. He says, in a time of climate change and mass extinction, gardens matter more than ever. And that's my vision, I think, um, that I would hope that I, in my small way, and other people who are interested in gardening could really be willing to experiment, try new things, that we could link our um, ecosystems to each other and really change the way that city and the countryside look. We've got schoolyards, highways, um, our office complexes. I just love to see us, us uh, garden differently. And there are many good examples of this. And uh, I know there are a lot more in Europe um, as Joan was referring to earlier. And so there's really good examples on how to do this. This is what I did. So these are two resources that I use. These are the two books recommended by Dan Maffei who is um, a garden designer in Kenneth Square, the No Maintenance Perennial Garden Book, and Planting in a Post-Wide World. And I really recommend both of these books. They're great. Um, they help me to, with kind of a transformation that I could really understand about gardens not being, or gardens being dynamic, that I'm not planting something to tend, um, that I don't want to change like my lawn or a tree that I'm pruning or shrub that I'm just working at so hard, keeping the weeds away from it and um, having it be you know, a hedge or something like that, that I could um, learn about what grows well, um, native plants first, but filling in with other kinds. The idea being to really cover the ground um, that Short plants mostly have shallow roots, tall plants have deep roots. The two can grow side by side. The deep roots grow through the shallow roots and you can have plants really close together. The idea being that this is what a meadow is like. Um, so, I, so looking at my front yard and studying it for a couple of years while I was getting up the courage to do this, <laughs> I was noticing what I had in the way of requirements for light, studied the soil a little bit under the grass in my front yard noticed how much um, rain I got, the lay of the land a little bit. And then I started to compile a list of plants that would give me a variety of colors and textures and heights um, throughout the growing season. And then the plan was to plant them as close together as the, they would allow. And my management of this would be to, once the plants were established, was to just cut them down and chop up all the plant debris, all the little woody stems, all the short stems, any leaves that were left at the end of winter. So once a year, I cut it down in March and I just drop the cuttings on the ground at the base of the plants. So first of all, I had to get rid of the lawn and I didn't want to remove the sod that was there. I took this dogwood tree dug it out and took it to my sister-in-law's farm in Avondale. And so that I just had a 20 by 30 foot square of grass. And um, this may cause some people to shudder, but I used agricultural vinegar, which is just much, much stronger than the vinegar in the, your kitchen cabinet, sprayed it on the lawn. And there's no other plants around it that would be affected by that. So on a windless day, a couple days in a row, I sprayed vinegar on this to kill the grass. Any persistent um, uh, plants that were still growing in my lawn that was supposed to have nothing but grass and weeds, I used some burnout on. Um, burnout is acetic acid and clove oil, I believe. So the grass is dead. 
I put in a little fence around it to border it, <clears throat> reducing the size just a little bit. And then um, I made a plant list of the kinds of things that I would so as you can see, literally laying out the plants in their buckets, and then we're digging them in on our hands and knees. My husband, David, did a lot of that digging for me, very grateful. And we more or less, more or less figured, <laughs> followed this drawing. Um, that was in about a period of about 10 days in August of uh, two, two years ago, two summers ago. Oops, wrong way. And by the uh, October of that same summer, what you see on the left is um, how the plants had come along. That's an aster in front. And there's some agastache in the back corner. Uh, it's just be covered with all kinds of bees and other pollinators. Um, I just leave the landscape alone during the winter. Let all those beautiful seed heads stay there. Um, I hope it's become home to different insects. And um, I just leave it there all winter, don't do anything. Then in March, I come in with my um, hedge clippers and my hand pruners and I cut everything down and uh, drop, as I said, drop all those cuttings down on the ground around the plants. So here we are in March of a year ago, just a year ago. Um, and you can see I came in in some of the bare spaces that will soon be covered with taller grasses. And I put in, I had planted the fall before some bulbs and those are starting to bloom in the first and second screen from left to right on the top. You can see the grasses starting to come along. Some alliums are blooming. And um, so now we're in maybe June, I think, um, of 2020. And there I am with my uh, pandemic, haven't been to the hairdresser to get my hair cut for about three months, I think. <laughs> um, next picture. Um, this is in July. The top slides are from July and you can see the variety of plants that are there. I hope you can see them. Filling up almost all the space with very little space um, around. Is that in everybody's picture? Okay, thanks David. Um, so, you know, right around the 4th of July, is there Coreopsis, um, some more alliums, some grasses, um, just a number of different plants. Um, then we went away for two months last summer, left the 16th of July and, no, one month, excuse me, 16th of July and came home, I don't know, the 20 something of August and didn't do anything to my front yard at all. Um, came home and it looked just as good as when I'd left with, you know, plants just moving along through their growing cycle. Um, I started to keep track of some of the insects um, that come and visit the garden. And that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Um, I think I brought a praying mantis home from the nursery and ever since then, I've had a lot of praying mantises in the, in the yard. This is a, a buckeye, um, painted lady. Obviously see a lot of other um, insects and plants, but I haven't started taking photographs of them. So this is last fall in October. You're looking at an aster in the lower right corner. Oops, now my slides are not advancing. I wonder why my slides are frozen. Let's see. I'm not at my last slide. Was anybody there? <laughs> well, Sally, if you click on the screen, it might yeah. activate it again, and then you might be able to advance it. Thank you. Oh, great. I think we did it. So the um, toward the end of the growing season, thank you for that tip, I appreciate it. End of the growing season, you can see the fall colors. This is um, Oxydendron or Barium tree, some grasses, my asters. And then this is what it looked like coming through the winter. This is a picture from this year, the second picture on the 4th of March. And 
then because I knew we were going to come on the road to visit our children again um, this spring, I went in um, about the 20th of March and started cutting things down. And that's when I found this praying mantis um, egg case that you see with the white circle around it in the top right hand slide. And I said, uh oh, I am a little bit early, um, but I still have to do the cutting down. And as you can see, all these pieces of uh, uh, plant material on the ground are just what I chopped off of the plants. Um, and I'm doing that because, you know, they're, they're going to be ready to grow in a new season. And because I planted bulbs and their crocuses are already starting to come up. And um, so that is just very recently, the front yard. And that brings me to the end of my slides. When we get home at the, in, a, in another month, I'm hoping to see a lot of um, a lot of other things growing in the yard, and we'll be well into um, growing season number two. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry for the technical glitches. Um, I hope you could see the slides, and um, I'm looking forward to the other speakers sharing. Yay. Thank you, Sally. At this point, you need to stop sharing your screen. OK. Let me figure out how to do that. Escape. Uh, close that. At the at the top of your screen. There we go. Wonderful. 